guys who are really uh, trying to start their own business, very young entrepreneurs, they are very eager to hear from you. We will hear from uh, Mr. Patrick for like um, 15 minutes, then we will have like 5 minutes to 10 minutes QIBA, and then he will be sitting here along with us and we will be listening to you. And you will be doing the pitching, uh, these four teams will do the pitch, the pitch is only 5 minutes, and then we will give you, they will give you some comments. Yeah, five minutes only. Okay. Uh, again, can we come him with a big hand? Thank you. Oh, so many microphones. All right. Uh, put that one on the side. I got one on each side. All right. Thank you. All right. So, good afternoon. Sorry we're late. Uh, I'm Jordan. Uh, how many people here are actually from the line? Raise your hands. Okay, and the rest of Jordan? Do we have any people from outside of Jordan? Where are you from? No. Outside. Yes? Oh, welcome. Well, you should welcome me, right? <laughs> um, all right, so. I'm really pleased to be here. I've always wanted to come to Jordan, and I have never quite made it here. I've been everywhere else around here, but I was in the region in Beirut for a uh, conference in Endeavor, and I called the embassy and I said, if I come to Jordan, will you maybe find some places for me to do some talks? And they said, we'd be delighted, and so here we are. And so I had a chance, you might have noticed I went to the Dead Sea this weekend, so I'm a little red. Um, and what I want to talk about a little bit is some ideas for business tenants. So I started my career, I, now I talk about entrepreneurship. I want you to know, until 10 years ago, I went every day to a bank and worked in the people. So I was not an entrepreneur at all. Um, I've always worked with entrepreneurs, but I was a very corporate guy. Um, and so I had to learn the hard way what is entrepreneurship. And um, we'll talk about that some more. But in the past number of years, I've invested in companies all over the world. I've invested in companies in the United States, obviously, but in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, um, Mongolia, Turkey, China, um, and many other places. I've lost my business. And so I've seen companies all over the world, and what I've been able to see is lots of pitches. And I've learned from seeing all these pitches, probably at this point thousands of pitches, in business plan, what works for me and what doesn't. So I just wanted to give you a couple of the things that I've learned and hope that it will help you as you think about maybe things. How many of you actually have thought about maybe starting a company of your own someday? Okay. I say, if you're, not raising your, if you're not raising your hand, I'm glad you're here, but I'm surprised you're here. Um, but the first thing you should know about me, just to get started, the most important thing is, um, who here has heard of FOMA here in this now? Anybody? FOMA? Anybody? Yes. You're the only one. Anybody else know? Well, I thought more of you would know this because it's a kind of big term in some parts of the world, but it's a term that I actually invented when I was in Harvard Business School. And it means the idea of you're missing out is the idea that we always want to be doing things. We go on Facebook, we see our friends at a party, and we wish we were at that party. We see them on vacation at the Dead Sea, and we wish we were there. And so as entrepreneurs, we see entrepreneurs entrepreneur opportunities all around us, and we can suffer from the fear of missing out. And so if you think about your business plan and your pitch, you've got to factor that in. How do you get an investor or a customer to have a fear of missing out on buying your service or investing in your company? So here are the things that I would encourage you to think about as you design a business plan. The first is thinking globally from day one. So Jordan, um, is a great country, but it's not a massive country, it's not a huge country, but you're in an area that has lots of other markets that you can affect. And we'll talk about that a bit later, but it's also, these days, there is no local business. Everything we do is global. We're connected all over the world. My taxi driver yesterday, from the Dead Sea to Amman, told me a story about how we met a woman on Facebook and moved to the United States for six months. Okay, that's the world we live in. And so it's really important, no matter what you're doing, to try to behave and structure your company with a global mindset. And I want to tell you a story about a guy named Diego Saez here. 
So Diego is from Argentina. He's from this, he's not even from Buenos Aires. He's from Tucumán, Argentina, which is a city of one million people. Any, probably anybody ever here is Tucumán, Argentina? Right, nobody, of course. He built a company that now has raised over $10 million, that has done millions and millions of sales, um, all from Argentina. And why is that? It's actually a smart suitcase that you can control with your phone. Why is that? Because he didn't think about the world the way that you're taught in school, where it's one way, a certain way, and this country's rich, and this country's poor, and this country has power, and this country doesn't have power. He turned it upside down and looked at the world a different way. And in this world, Argentina's on the top. And so he never thought about, oh, I'm just from Argentina, I can't build a business that is global scope, or oh, I, you know, he came to the United States, he didn't say, oh, like, my English isn't perfect, I could never find an investor here. He just came, and he built a company uh, of 30 employees, about 28 of them are in Argentina. I was actually just there in their headquarters. But they have a company that has clients now in over 200 countries in the world. So it's a really good story about how Sometimes when we're, you know, I, I, I meet with entrepreneurs all over the world and they say, like, you know, it's much easier if I were from the United States. And my answer to that is, it doesn't matter. You were born in a certain place. This is a world that's interconnected. It doesn't matter anymore. The borders are not there. The second is, learn from Silicon Valley, but then do your own thing. So a lot of times I meet entrepreneurs, it depends on what you're doing. You may have a social venture. May not be Silicon Valley we're looking at. But we're always told, oh, um, the greatest companies in the world are Apple and Uber and Google and all that sort of stuff. That's fine. But the problem with Silicon Valley is that it faces the center of the world. And the reality is that Silicon Valley is a small area of land, it's probably about the size of the city of Milan. And there's a whole wide world outside. So while it's a great place to draw examples from and learn and see what to do and what not to do, the realities of building business anywhere else in the world are completely different. And so as you think about the Silicon Valley, it's important to get Take those ideas back to where you're building your business, anywhere across the world, and think about how you can actually apply those lessons very locally to build something that's relevant to the, to the local market. The third, consider starting part-time. So this is what my whole book is about, The 10% Entrepreneur, the idea that all of us should be spending 10% of our time and if possible, 10% of our money, starting companies, investing in companies, being an advisor to companies, which is where you invest your time in exchange for ownership without leaving our day job or maybe doing it while we were a student. So when you start a company, uh, if you go full time straight away, you have all this pressure. Say you have to pay your rent or you have to buy food and you don't have a salary because you're trying to build a startup. It puts a lot of pressure on you to succeed right away. And most people, by the way, won't succeed. Entrepreneurship is great, but the reality is that more than half of new companies fail. And that's okay, that's just the process. It wouldn't be such a difficult and process and it wouldn't have such a big payoff if it were easy, right? Nothing worthwhile doing is easy. But at the same time, we live in a world that is very flexible. We carry around in our pocket, right? I don't know where mine is, here it is. I mean, this thing is only 10 years old. You can run your entire life from your phone, right? Because of your cell phone, because of the internet, because of connectivity, because of the low cost of putting up a website, for example, today. When I started my job, my first job out of college, it was $50,000 minimum to build a website. Today, with Squarespace, we could probably, all of us, have websites up in 10 minutes for, well, maybe an hour, for almost nothing. And that's a service that, I don't know if you have here, but, um, you know, there are lots of different tools to do that. When I started working, one gigabyte of storage cost $8,000. Today, it's basically free. Now, apart from making me feel like I'm really old, it reminds me that any of us today could probably sit in a group of four people for very little money, probably less than $100, have a company up and running and have our first customer by the end of the week. And we could do that flexibly in the evening, on our lunch break from our cell phone while we we're in class and not paying attention. And you don't have to quit your job. And so many of you may have dreams of being an entrepreneur, but maybe you don't have the money or you don't have the idea today to figure out what you want to do. And what I want to remind you of, and it's really important, is that you don't have to worry about that because you can go out and get a job or you can start something when you're in school. 
Try it, test it, see if it works, and then maybe then go full-time. Or maybe have it on the side for the rest of your life. Some people do that too. But entrepreneurship isn't an all or nothing proposition. And as you think about your business, consider that as, you, as you're thinking about your business plan and, and how you want to sort of put it together. Next, start regionally and expand with rigor. So I want to tell a story. I love this story. I've been telling it all day. Um, anybody know Zaid? Anybody heard of this guy? You're going to hear, he's, yeah, here we got one. He is going, you're going to know this guy, I promise you. Zaid is, um, I met him last week in Beirut. He's from Jordan, he's from here. He was in Beirut as part of the Endeavor um, Entrepreneurship Program. It's a program where you basically, um, entrepreneurs with new companies go, they pitch judges, and then the judges select very special entrepreneurs to be part of this network. And Zaid is from here, and he, um, anybody here ever heard of iFood.jo? Okay, so he started that. And he sold that to a company called Delivery Hero, which now you're probably using. And then on the side, like a good 10% entrepreneur, he started his next venture. And what Zaid learned from his first venture, and entrepreneurs are people who learn. We learn, we learn, and we improve, and we change, and we adapt. What he learned doing that first venture was a couple of things. Number one, he learned that it's really hard just to operate in Jordan if you want to be big, right? Jordan's a great market, but it's not a huge market. Number two, he learned that he understood the market here really well, and he could test things here but then go outside. And so what he did right away, he started out in Jordan, but he went straight away to Egypt. Obviously, Egypt is about 10 times the size of Jordan. And so he started straight away. He's in Jordan day one. He has a partner from iFood who he met there, who came and joined him. So he already has a trusted partner in Cairo. And he spends a week, a month in Egypt building his business there. So he's using Jordan as a laboratory to test ideas, to make sure that the idea works, and then he's attacking Egypt right away. And I think that's a really good strategy for people from this region, because if you were in the United States, you could very easily stay in the United States forever. You know, it's easy. We have a lot, I don't know how many people live in the United States, maybe 350 million or something. Um, not, not entirely sure. Um, I do know how many live in Jordan though. And um, that's the official statistic, by the way. I'm sure there's more. But um, when you're in Jordan, if you really want to build a big business that could attract a buyer from outside the region or that could become the leader, then you need to go regionally. And so if you think about how to do that very carefully, rigorously, really in a smart way, not spending too much money, it can be a powerful way to grow, but also in doing so in a low risk way. Next, fundraising is not about money, it's about control. So investors always, or sorry, entrepreneurs come to me all the time, tell me they want to raise money. I want to raise money, I want to pitch investors. And do you guys have Dragon's Den here, or the Shark Tank? Do you have those shows? The shows on TV where people pitch for money? Well, you had one, so you, you, you're, it's like this, they make a game out of it, right? The reality about fundraising is that, yes, you get money, of course there's some money involved, but really what happens, the minute you take a dollar from somebody else or a dinar from somebody else, you have a boss. So entrepreneurship is supposed to be about freedom. I'm my own boss. I run my own show. The minute you sell part of your company to somebody else, it's no longer just your company. You have people that you have to call every month or every quarter and tell them what you're doing. If you have a problem or you run into issues, depending on what the agreement is between you and your investors, they could even fire you. And so as you think about raising money, First of all, I know in Jordan, it's more complicated, right? There are less sources of funding. Um, but also, um, investors tend to be more demanding than some other places. So as you think about that, try to figure out if you can wait as long as possible to raise money. Because the more established you are, the more traction you have, the more your business plan has advanced, the more power you have, and the less control you'll have to give up. So it's a really important thing to think about. And that's also, by the way, on that point, given the fact that things are so inexpensive these days, that building your site out is inexpensive, that tech is inexpensive, that storage is inexpensive, you need far less money to do far more than you ever did in the past, so you can wait longer. 
And here's a picture of a guy. This guy's from Colombia, so you know the country of Colombia. And he moved to the United States. He never raised one dollar. He did. He grew slowly. Yes, he grew slowly. He had a job. He did it on the side. But now he has a company worth fifty million dollars. He got invited to meet President Barack Obama because he's an immigrant. And Barack Obama was wanted to meet with immigrant entrepreneurs because you know immigrants are a really important part of our country. And I think his story is so great because he always had control. He never had another boss again. And finally, seek out globally minded mentors. So yes, you're here in Jordan, and you're going to have great mentors that are local mentors, people who probably never operate outside of Jordan. You're going to have mentors who have worked all over the world. But you don't just have to have mentors that are situated here in Jordan. You can use LinkedIn, Twitter, all kinds of other tools to find people who are experts in the things you want to do and just reach out to them. Don't be shy. I swear to God, every day I get a LinkedIn message from somebody somewhere in the world asking me for help, a question. And you know what? Usually I respond because why not? It's two minutes of my life and if I can help somebody, why wouldn't I do that? But you have to be careful who you choose. Because if you choose the, <laughs> if you choose the wrong person, you might get fired. Um, I don't know. I have a quick case study. Do we want to go into that or should we just go into the pictures? I think maybe uh, let's open the Q&A and uh, maybe you, it's better we apply it. I totally agree. Yeah. So we listen to the guys and then they will have the notes. And the better that you guys ask me hard questions. Yeah. And don't be shy, ask me anything. So, guys, who have a question? Usually, yes, we need someone. They start shy. So. I know, but don't be shy. Okay. Just feel free to ask anything you want. And tell me okay. if you think I'm wrong, by the way. I, I've, you know, I'm wrong sometimes. Um, Great. Uh, my question is, does uh, freelancing count in part-time job? Great question. <laughs> For the 10% uh, entrepreneurship? That's a, okay, good, very good question. Um, the 10% entrepreneur idea is about ownership. So when you're a freelancer, like say I have a company and you're freelancing for me, you, I don't know what you do, you build my website and I pay you a thousand dinar and then you, I say thank you very much, and then we're done. And then my company becomes the next Facebook. I become worth billions of dinar. You have the thousand that I paid you. If you had, say, taken 500 and I gave you 1% of my company, you would be really, really rich. And then we would totally hang out at the Dead Sea together. <laughs> and so the 10% entrepreneur concept is about ownership in something. Now, freelancing is a great way to get started. You can meet people, make contacts build a portfolio of skills, have things you can say to people, look what I did, but always try to become an owner of different things if you can. That's really the, the concept. You're welcome. In case anyone asks in Arabic, you oh, don't be shy Arabic speakers. Uh, so we have only very close the group of entrepreneurs. Please. No, wait. Okay, go ahead. Yalla. Now she speaks English. Oh. Uh, Who's first? Um, my question is, uh, does every um, project depend on the field they're in so they can be registered or not, or to be under an umbrella, like an organization or association? I'm not sure I understood your question. Like, for an example, like, um, our project is about refugees. We are in the refugees field. Is it better to be registered as a company or to be under an organization? Ah, like part of an international organization. Yes. Really, okay, I think it's, it's, there's no yes or no answer. Here's how I think about that. So first of all, um, are you working with Syrian refugees? Yes. Fantastic. I just was in Zakhle visiting some camps there last week. So I now know a little bit about the topic. Um, I think 
when you're building a new company from, that nobody's seen before, a new venture, a new social enterprise, whatever it is, one of the fundamental things is credibility. You need to establish credibility for people to want to work with you because they're like, who are you? Um, so one way we get credibility is we go to good universities like University of Jordan. We say, like, I went to you know, the school, whatever. That builds credibility. Or this is my family. Or here's where I worked before. Um, another way we build credibility is, for example, being associated with an international organization or having adv an advisory board of people who are well known in the field. So I wouldn't say that you necessarily have to do one thing or another, but if you find that people don't trust you maybe or are doubtful and one way to maybe mitigate that or address that problem would be to associate yourself with an international organization. Now the downside to that, there's upsides and downsides, is when you're a part of an international organization, probably they have a better infrastructure for fundraising and they have more resources. The downside is you have less control and so you may have to play by their own rules. So as you think about what you really care about, what really drives you, what you really want to do, that will kind of inform your decision.